Please welcome Leslie Beal. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, you, you never realize how old you've gotten until somebody reads your bio. So, yay. Yay, 25 years of experience. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here on a beautiful morning to talk about this nice, breezy topic of difficult conversations and conflict. What a great way to start a sunny spring morning is with conflict and difficult conversations. Um, as Paul said, I'm Leslie Beal. I'm pleased to be with you today. What I'm going to share with you for the next hour and a half is going to be a portion of a full day training that we give to clients. So um, before I do that, I've really worked hard to select the things I thought were going to move the needle most in the brief time that we have. But I would love to hear from some of you. What is it you most hope to get from your time today? What is it you want to walk out the door having be different or knowing? Yes. It's a bit of a confession. So how to get that past that first stage of this is so wrong, I just want to hurt it. Oh, so like dealing with your own anger about something? Yeah. 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 So you can actually start to listen and do some of the things you're going to suggest this time. Okay, great. I think we'll get there. Anybody else have something specific? Yes. Resolving conflict and still being able to respect what we're with each other. Okay, so protecting that relationship that exists there. Yeah. Anybody else? Come on. A, a practical tool that we can use in a lot of different situations. Yeah, if yeah absolutely. We're definitely going to get there. Yes, sir. I was thinking about just strategies for, for spotting these conversations and conflict before they even arise. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so you may not have to solve them, but you can stop them before they start. Okay, great. Great. Thank you for doing that. Here's the next thing I would like you to do. I want you to think about a potential difficult conversation that you know you need to have that either you haven't had a chance to get to, or if you were honest, you've been putting off. Or I want you to think about a conflict situation that may arise for you in the near future. And let me just, little side here, you're going to hear me talk about difficult conversations and conflict sort of interchangeably in this session, and I don't want that to be confusing for you. We really see in the work that we do that difficult conversations and conflict exist on a continuum. Right? And it has a lot to do with your personality and your tolerance for these sorts of things, whether you label it a tough conversation or conflict. All right? So I don't want you to get lost when I'm sort of flopping back and forth between the two. But go ahead and take just a couple of minutes, and if you need to jot down some notes, you can, about that conflict situation or that difficult conversation that you know you need to have that you've been putting off. Some things to think about. What's involved? Right, what's the issue? What's at stake? Right? What's the risk if I don't do something about this? Who are the players that are involved? And if you know, kind of what are the personalities at play? Everybody got a good example in mind? All right. So what makes conflict and difficult conversations so important? And I can tell you this is one of the most requested training topics that we get, and it's one of the most common conversations that we have with clients even before they're talking to us about what they want to be trained on. Like, what's going on with your team? Tell me what's hard for you as a leader. Oh, we're stuck in conflict. We don't communicate well. So nobody's willing to say the hard thing, right? These are the sorts of things that we hear over and over again when we're working either with individual leaders in executive coaching or when we're working with teams in sort of team development situations. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's so important that we deal with conflict and difficult conversations? I think conflict can drive positive change if it's dealt with. Yeah, I think I 100% agree with you. And if we were doing a full day training on this, we would talk about what's the ideal conflict point in a team. Like, where should we be? Because you're right, it can drive positive change. What else makes this important? Uh, it often seems so easy to avoid certain topics and just dance around it. Yeah, it feels prevalent, doesn't it? Difficult conversations and conflicts seem like it's something that's always there. And no matter how well we're doing, we just can't get away from it, right? You could be hitting your record numbers, 
regardless of what your metrics are, you could be hitting record numbers and still have conflict and difficult conversations you needed to deal with. The thing I want you to also understand, though, is that conflict and difficult conversations have a direct impact on the bottom line, particularly if you can deal with them effectively. So one of the things that we know is that teams that can communicate effectively, and communicating effectively means dealing with the tough stuff, those teams make 50% better decisions. All right. So you think about the decisions that get made in your business every day. Which products are we going to take to market? Which new service lines are we going to offer? How are we going to price things? Which clients do we want to work with? What's our new marketing plan? All of those decisions are higher quality, and I would also say faster decisions, which matters a lot in today's world, when the team communicates well. So those are bottom line issues, right? Bottom line issues. Organizations that have effective communication have a 50% higher level of trust. Why does trust matter? Trust matters for the proper functioning of a team as a whole. I like to think about trust as sort of the grease that keeps the gears grinding in a team. You can go for a little while without trust and keep functioning, but before long, everything's going to grind to a halt. Right? We'll also talk about why trust is not only an outcome of being able to deal with these things well, but it's also something that you need on the front end. All right, so trust is going to come in quite a bit in our conversation this morning. And then finally, 67% of employees say that unresolved conflict is affecting their productivity. All right. Now, I don't know about you, but stats to me, you read them so long and they sort of go whoosh, over your head, in one ear and out the other, whatever the saying is you want to use. I want you to imagine three employees on your team. Three employees. Now imagine two of them just told you, we have so much unresolved conflict that I am not as productive as I could be in my job. That's what this statistic is saying. It's not saying, I feel gross, it's affecting my engagement, I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. It's not a, it's not a feel good sort of thing. These folks are saying, I can't do my job as well as I feel like I should be able to do it. I can't do my job as well as I feel like I should be able to do it. So what makes difficult conversations difficult? What does it take for you to say, ugh, this feels hard? There's a lot of emotion in the room between the two parties. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. In fact, you, you win the prize for today because this is why I use this bear, right? It's big and scary. Emotions feel big and scary and risky. And that's one of the common things that we hear about what makes difficult conversations hard is that they're emotional. Yeah, back to the trust issue. Uh, if you can't trust your colleagues that, that they're going to help you and, and they're going to you know, somehow punish you or look down on you, then you're not going to bring them up. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing that we hear really frequently is relationship feels at risk, right? The emotions are big and it feels like there's something at risk. I'm not sure I can trust you. I'm not sure if I step out, it's gonna be okay. Those are relationship risks. Sometimes with people that we're gonna work with for a long period of time, but even think about somebody who cuts in front of you at the deli counter at the grocery store, right? You don't have a long-term relationship with that person, but it still feels risky, right? What else makes conflict or difficult conversations feel hard? Krista? Just the unknown result, mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Yeah. Like if you do approach it, how's it going to turn out? Is it going to be worse? You know, sometimes just that unknown is scary. Yeah. The fear of the unknown is a big issue for a lot yeah. of us. Like, okay, it's pretty bad now. I would like to make it better, but what if I make it worse? What if I make it worse? What if I go through all the emotion <laughs> I put the relationship at risk and it backfires. All right. What else? You're missing one big one that I typically hear from folks. You don't want to hurt feelings. Okay, you don't want to hurt feelings. Some, of, some people don't want to hurt feelings. Other people don't want people to get mad at them, right? And I would argue those are sort of two sides of the same coin. So all of this emotional swirl gets involved. Sometimes, also, we don't trust our own emotions. 
that's an element of um, the emotionality of conflict and difficult conversations that I think gets missed. It's like, what's going to happen if I wade into this and I get really frustrated and I cry? What's going to happen if I wade into this and I lose my temper because I don't have a great tool set to be able to stay calm in these situations? So feeling like we can't manage our own emotions, feeling like we are not going to be able to deal with the emotions that are coming at us, all of those things can make conflict and difficult conversations feel tough. What else? What else? How do you get ready for these kinds of conversations? <laughs> just, just go with the gut, right? Just, just lay into it. This is the other thing that we hear really commonly from folks is, I have no idea how to get myself ready for this, right? I know how to go into a sales presentation. I know how to go in and have a conversation about a project. I know how to do those things. I have no idea how to prepare for this conversation because I have no idea how it's going to go, all right? I have no idea how it's going to go. So all of those things make difficult conversations feel difficult. Did we miss anything? It's just awkward. Why? Because you don't want to point fingers at anyone. You don't want to tell anyone that they're doing something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of us don't know how to go into conflict conversations without blaming, right? Without pointing the finger at somebody, without making the other person feel wrong. And let's be honest, sometimes in work situations, we do have to point the finger a little bit, right? We do have to say, you missed this deadline. What's going on, right? You didn't do this right. What's going on? The other thing that I notice sometimes, particularly in conversations that are sort of feedback conversations, accountability conversations, is there's a little bit of imposter syndrome that shows up, right? Who, who am I to, to sort of wade into this and criticize this person for this because I've missed deadlines, right? Anybody ever struggle with that? Yeah, or I don't know how they do their job. One of the times we see this is when people get promoted and they're now managing people whose jobs they haven't done before, right? And they're like, oh, I don't know how to do that anymore. I don't know what the rules are. What else makes this feel hard? With the workforce being so slimmed down, mm -hmm. you don't want to risk losing it. Yeah. yeah. We are hearing a lot still about labor shortages and those sorts of things, even with all the news about layoffs and those kinds of things in certain sectors, we are still hearing a lot about that. And I'm hearing a lot from clients. We have to be really careful how we handle conflict conversations because somebody's going to walk out the door and we're not sure how long it's going to take to replace them. So that's that relationship risk sort of cranked up really high. I don't know if the numbers are significant, but it seems like every month or so you hear about a shooting involving a disgruntled employee. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a fear. There can be a real fear. And depending on who you are and your relative size and the situation that you find yourself in and who you're talking to, like you can feel physically at risk, right? You can feel physically at risk. Anything else? Do we miss anything? All right. So think about your difficult conversation, right? Think about the conflict situation that you identified. Which ones of these things are going on for you? Which ones of these things are standing in the way? I sort of like to imagine a speed bump, right? That's slowing you down from getting to that difficult conversation, that's slowing you down from addressing the conflict. What's in your speed bump? What's it built out of? Relationship risk, not trusting your own emotions, not knowing how to prepare. Which ones of these things are in your speed bump? Just take a minute to think about that. Let me ask you this question too. If we think about different groups of people, right? Everything from total strangers in traffic to somebody you're very close with like a spouse or a family member or a best friend to everybody in between, casual acquaintances, friends, employees, 
Is there a group that it's easiest for you to engage in conflict with? Who's easiest for you? The people, you the people you don't know. Who disagrees with that and says, no, no, I'd much rather engage in conflict with people that I'm close with? <laughs> yeah. So this is a, the reason I point this out is because this is a personality difference. And this is a good way for you to measure and sort of check yourself as to how much relationship risk matters to you. Because my guess is relationship risk matters a lot to you. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's why, like, Somebody that I don't know or I'm not connected with, I can have a hard conversation with them because I don't really care, right? I don't care as much. But for some people, they really need that trust, right? They really need that first. And so for them, it's easier to engage in conflict with somebody they're close with. You need to know that about yourself as a leader because it will have an impact on how you move into conflict in the workplace, okay? So think about, is it easier for you to sort of have a tough conversation with somebody you don't know well or somebody you know really well, and why? What's the core difference there? Okay, what's the core difference? Are there any particular topics that you think are the most difficult when it comes to difficult conversations? Maybe a, um, a team member not meeting expectations of their job responsibilities. Okay. Any particular expectations? Uh, I guess maybe workload or okay. you know, fulfilling the role as expected. And why does that feel particularly difficult to you? Um, just that you had your expectations high, I guess, and then they're not meeting those goals. Yeah. So you're having to sort of tell somebody that they fail. Yes, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can tell you for me personally and for a lot of the folks that we work with, it's easier to do that when there's a clear metric. Like, hey, this was due on May the 1st and you didn't get, get it to me on May the 1st. That feels really black and white. When it is more ambiguous, when it is, you just didn't handle this client interaction the way we wanted you to. And I can't tell you the exact words you should have said instead, but it just didn't feel, that can sometimes feel really, really tough for people. There's a little bit of a difference though. Some people really shy away from that clear like all in, you missed the deadline, that's the end of the story. So that's another thing to think about is what topics are at play. Who else has a particular topic that they find difficult? Yeah? I would say it's non-performance where I know there's something outside the workplace that's dragging on that. Yeah. Well, we're not getting involved with child care issues or drug abuse or all the other things that yeah. I can't really address, but I need to work them. Yeah. And what makes that feel hard? Uh, because it can be a tar baby. Like, if I get involved in that part of it, I'm stuck with it. 80% uh -huh. of the time when somebody says to me, I really don't like wading into the emotional outside of work things with people, that's the exact phrase that they use, right? I'm going to get stuck in the emotion. That's a personality style. So the other thing I want you to start to understand, and we're going to talk in just a minute about conflict styles, but your personality and how you are wired plays a huge role in how you deal with conflict. So if you're somebody who thinks self-awareness is really maybe not all that important, these are really concrete examples of why it is, because some people love wading into the emotional stuff, right? And they're very, very comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. To be clear, it's not so much the emotion of it, is uh, I'm a fixer. And if I, people start telling me about a tangible problem, I'm going to try to help. And yeah. then, you know, the way that ends. Yeah. I mean, I sometimes tell uh, clients that if this is not performance, it's because of alcoholism. You probably don't want to know, because then you're dealing with a, a, a workplace uh, accommodation and mm -hmm. treatment. So. Yeah. We, we do sometimes worry that we're opening up a can of worms that then we have to deal with right, that then we have to deal with. And for many of us, we like being able to check something off a box. And sometimes conflict doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like we're gonna be able to get to the end and tie it up with a little bow, put it in a box and put it on the shelf. With those issues too, it can be a lot harder to have another conversation toward when the issue's still going on and it's like drastically affecting our performance. Because then there's a fine line between <coughs> sympathy and you know, they still have to meet these expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not knowing where the boundaries are, not knowing where the rules are. 
Anybody else? Particular topics that feel difficult? Okay. What about a protected work class? Mm -hmm. Older, gay, lesbian. Mm -hmm. What makes that feel particularly difficult? Is that a boundary yeah. issue? Like, I'm not really sure what the rules no, it's are. No, you know, it's something performance needs to be addressed, has to be addressed, if you don't want the company, mm -hmm. you know, At liability risk. reasons, but you have to, at the end of the day, you know, you know, make it happen, so you have to have those conversations, but it's always a little more difficult when it's protected class. Yeah, the, the path is narrower, right? The path is narrower. So that's, when Paul said I practice law, that's the kind of law I practiced, was employment law. Mm -hmm. So accommodations, protected classes, all of those sorts of things. You are not in the workplace dealing with a perfectly straightforward world. There are a lot of rules and regulations, right? There are a lot of landmines that you could potentially step into and not feeling like you know how to navigate those and not feeling like you wanna put the company at risk is, a, is an important part that sort of cranks up the pressure on these kinds of conversations. Anybody wanna share anything else about what makes these conversations hard? And I'll just piggyback on what she was saying. Like, you have an issue, it's not resolved, and it, then it gets worse. And then the other employees see the issue not being resolved, and then that affects morale. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the big picture thing that you're, okay, we need to address this. Yeah, so it can set off this sort of ripple effect, right? Either because of what you're talking about, like we didn't deal with it effectively, and now it's a thing, right? right? It's a big thing. Or, because people drop sides. Nobody's ever had that work happen in their workplace, right? <laughs> Nobody's ever had these factions develop where it's like, no, no, it's this way. No, no, it's that way. And as a leader, as somebody who sort of has to wade into this, it can feel really challenging to know how to navigate those competing interests and just try to get everybody back to work, right? Try to get everybody back to work. So relationships, emotionality, human beings are difficult, right? We're complex, we have different perspectives, we have different personalities, that makes this all very difficult, okay? All right, who in here is a cook? Anybody a cook? Okay, so I want you to think about, if you do this right, like when you have time to do it right, not on any random Tuesday night, perhaps last night, when you started late and didn't have the time to do it the right way. What do you do first when you're cooking a recipe? Make sure you have all the ingredients. What are you going to do next? Prep. Prep, right? You're going to chop. You're going to preheat the oven. You're going to do all of those sorts of things. Then what? You take a break. <laughs> you decide it's all a mistake and order takeout, right? <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> Lament the fact that you had so many children. I understand this. Um, you then start to combine things, right? Then it's time to really start to cook. I think it's a very helpful analogy to think about difficult conversations as cooking a meal, all right? So if we think about difficult conversations as cooking a meal, what are the ingredients that you need to have? So if you're going to go to the pantry and say, what do we have? What are the ingredients for conflict or difficult conversations to go well? Examples. Examples. Yeah, you need to have some facts, right? Some, we used to call those camera checks, right? Like visions of what went wrong or data. Yeah, that's great. Or HR documentation. Some documentation. Supervisors or whoever it is. Okay, what else? What other ingredients do you want to have? Yeah, you want to allow yourself enough time. This is one of the ways that conflict and difficult conversation go really badly is you say, oh, this is not that big a deal. We can do it in 15 minutes. Nope. And one of two things happens. You just open it up and then it ripples through the organization or you, you try to squeeze it all in and put a bow on it and that's not effective either, right? So you need to allow enough time. What else? Yes? Uh, the mindset, I think like Tony said, with um, you know, like the anger you have, the initial issue, making sure that you're over that and you're in a, in a place where you're ready to have that conversation. Yeah, great. You really need to have yourself in a place where you can handle this um, from a, I call it a clean place, 
Like, am I over my own stuff about this? Am I calm? Am I feeling clear-headed? Do I feel like this? I'm being rational about this sort of thing? Um, so your mindset being in the right place. What else? Ingredients. Right? What do you need to have? We talked about it already, and we said it's both an ingredient of and an outcome of effective communication. It starts and ends with a T. <laughs> Trust, right? I'm going to tell you that your difficult conversations, your conflict situations will go better if you are investing in trust in your organizations on the front end, right? So if you are in a high trust team, right? If you are doing the work of developing trust in amongst the team, and that's a much broader topic than we have time to cover. But if you feel like, hey, this is a fairly high trust team, we're having a hiccup, that's a good ingredient to have. You're not always gonna have it. Sometimes you're gonna go to the pantry and you're gonna be like, oh man, we're out. Mm -hmm. What am I gonna sub? Right? I'm going to have to add a little more of this because that's missing. Right? So just think about on the front end, how high is the trust in this situation? How high is the trust? Okay? What other ingredients are nice to have if you're going to make a really delicious, difficult conversation? Listening. Listening. Yeah. yeah. These are skills. Right? This is the other thing that we haven't touched on. That's why you come to things like this, is to get skills. This is why you read books about difficult conversations. This is why you watch tech. All of that is about building skills. And the better your skills can be, people will say, like, how do I prepare for this? You prepare by building skills. You prepare by setting aside time. You prepare by getting your mindset clean. What other skills are useful to have? <clears throat> What other skills? Yes? I would say like candor. I don't think people like when you be around the bush with difficult conversations. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the skill of knowing how to communicate candidly, assertively, but not aggressively, man, that's a really difficult balance for many of us. We don't see it modeled very much in our life. Um, we, we tend to sort of be in this all or nothing world where I'm going to not say anything, not say anything, not say anything until I snap and then I say everything in a completely unthought out way, in a like pull no punches, let me tell you how it's going to be. People will often say to me like, what's the biggest mistake? I think the biggest mistake is that people put off conflict and difficult conversations so long that they are in this place where they're just like, I'm going to lay it all on the line, right? Much better to have it sooner and have it in a more constructive kind of way. So candor and assertive communication, really, really important. What else goes into this? Maybe empathy. empathy. Look, I just sent that right to you. I was like, am I going to have to spell empathy in my brain now? Um, empathy, right? What does that mean? And why does it matter? I think if you aren't all at you, it's you, it's you, and like, how can we help you? And you know, I, you know, say, you know, I understand that you're going through other things as well, and I get that. You know, if you can kind of bring them to that level, they don't feel like they're being attacked. Yeah. And they're more receptive, I think. Yeah. Empathy, the other sort of subtle ingredient I heard in that is questions. Right? Questions. We get really wrapped up because we feel this fear of the uncertain that Krista mentioned earlier with, like, I have to say these things. And when we are afraid of the uncertain, we shy away from questions. And questions demonstrate empathy. They help you understand the other person's perspective. And they help you build trust, right? So questions and empathy are two other really important ingredients. What else? Anybody ever gotten into uh, to one of these situations and realize, oh shoot, the person that needs to really be here is down the hall? Anybody ever done that? We're sitting here having this conversation and it's not going to solve anything until Joe down the hall is with us. Right? So in addition to setting aside enough time 
And I would also say really thinking about what are, what's that issue, right? What are all the issues, right? Spending some time thinking about that. You need to think about who are the key players. And you need to bring those people together if that's reasonable. But my point is you need to make a strategic decision about that. Not an oopsie, I'm halfway in and I realize we need to be having a broader conversation than we're having. What else? Tone of voice, yep, body language, tone of voice, very important. What do we want to communicate with our tone of voice and our body language? I think just calmness and not being aggressive, like you've mentioned, um, letting them know that, trying to build that trust. Yeah. What, what sort of body language sends the message that you're calm and not aggressive? Uh, just like sitting relaxed and not arms folded, mm -hmm. and, you know, not sitting too close to the other person. This is a really delicate balance. Anybody ever get frustrated about like, I didn't mean to ha I didn't mean for that to come across that way. Um, I will tell you, this is a place where you not only have to be self-aware of your personality, you have to be very aware of the relative power dynamics in a conversation. Um, if you are a particularly large person, and that can be tall, that can be just general overall size. If you are a particularly large person, people will often feel intimidated. If you tend to be a very loud person, people will often be easily intimidated by you. Um, if you have a very um, forceful way of communicating, if you're a very, if, if you would ever describe yourself as a passionate communicator, right? <laughs> then people might find you intimidating, right? You have to be aware of this. And this is where things like 360s, feedback from your team are really, really important because it's hard for us to know. It's really, really hard for us to know how we land on or are perceived by other people, right? Really, really difficult. Sometimes if you're a really quiet person, Right? I used to run into this one. I'm a very shy person by nature, very, very shy, sort of quiet person by nature. And people find that very intimidating, or they can. I can't tell you how many people I've hired who, after they were on my team for a while, said, man, you scared the living daylights out of me. And I'm going, what are you talking like? What, what are you talking about right now? Um, so you have to be really aware of all this, and it's a delicate dance. And this gets into that territory of like, how do I land on different people, right? How do I come across to women? How do I come across to people who are younger than me or older than me, right? Anybody had to give really tough feedback to somebody that was the same age as their parent? I have, right? Really tough, really personal hygiene kind of related feedback. That was fun. That was fun. So this can be really challenging, and you have to be aware of all of these nonverbal or subverbal kind of tone of voice issues. Right? What else? What other ingredients are we missing? Planning for the follow-up. Follow Say more. And why is that important? I think it shows that you mean business and it's important. Mm -hmm. And it builds that trust. Mm -hmm. It helps with the trust. Yeah. Yeah. People want to see that we're going to follow through. People want to see that we're going to follow through. And so planning for that follow through is really important, right? Do I have time on the calendar to come back in and revisit this? Do I really mean business about this? How many of you have been in a situation, and you could have been on either end of this, where a supervisor or a boss lost their temper and said, let me tell you how it's going to be. And two weeks later, you were like, that's not how it is, right? We, what happens the next time that person walks in your office and says, let me tell you how this is going to be? You don't believe them, right? In fact, this can get really, really out of hand. We, I've worked on an executive team where our CEO had this lovely habit of coming in and saying, only three things matter. <laughs> only three things matter, right? Very just 
frustrated with us as an executive team. Write these down. We would write down the three things. and Okay, we'd run with them. Two weeks later, come in, only three things matter. We'd write those down. Guess what? Not the same three things, <laughs> right? To the point where we started keeping a running list until we got up to about 115, and then we all decided he didn't have any better clue of what mattered than we did, and we should just do what we thought was best. So you have to be really careful when you're laying down the law to think about what is it I'm willing to follow through on? What is it that really matters here? And what's the best solution, right? We're really quick to just slap a Band-Aid on things, to just slap a Band-Aid on things. But thinking about what is the real problem here and what is the real best solution to solve it rather than just what is that knee-jerk kind of reaction where I just want to vent my anger at somebody. What else are we missing? Yeah, yeah. You need a neutral area. You do have to be aware a little bit of sort of power dynamics in this as well, right? Are you going to call somebody to your office? Are you going to go to their office? Are you going to bring them to the conference room? And it, that really depends on the specifics of your physical space, right? Some people, you bring them to a conference room and they're like, uh-uh, that's where people go to get fired, right? That's where people go to get fired. Or if you're in HR and you call somebody to your office, same thing. That's where people go to get fired or to get in trouble. It's like the principal's office, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully you've established enough trust in that function within the building that that's not the case. But you have to think about where am I going to have this and where is that person going to be best able to hear what I'm actually saying? Right? That's what we really want here. We don't want all the noise in the background to cloud the message. Okay. Yes? I had an HR um, director that years ago, something I latched on to is go for a walk and go side by side rather than in front of each other. Mm -hmm. And just take a walk and talk. Yeah. And how does that, how does that right. go? When you, when you know that that would be the best thing to do, it works well. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because you're side by side. You're not looking straight up. It doesn't feel conflict, and people are more likely to share. And I think it builds the trust better. Yeah, I agree with you. Be aware. I tend to be like a really heavy on eye contact person. That's probably why I got the feedback that I was intimidating, <laughs> um, like just giving people the stare all the time. Some people are really uncomfortable with that direct one-on-one -on -one eye contact. So. Kind of read in, if you have, this is where that relationship is so important. If you know the person that you're talking to, it can be much, much more helpful to say, like, is this going to be better? The other reason I think walking is sometimes really helpful is it moves some of that nervous energy through. It helps move some of the emotionality out of the system. Are we missing anything? We've got listening, questions, think about the time, think about the place, demonstrate empathy. Yes? This one I've been hesitating to mention, and that is having in mind what a good outcome is, but I don't want to be tied to a particular outcome either. Yeah. Yeah. This is where people get wrapped around the axle about how do I prep for this. Um, and my advice is always you want to have an agenda, right? You want to have like key bullet points so that you don't get swept away in the emotion and you want to have an idea of what a good outcome is, but you want to keep a little flex in your knees, right? You want to be calm enough, resilient enough that you can move with the moment, but don't go in loosey-goosey, right? And I would say the higher the stakes are, the more you need those bullet points because depending on the emotion that comes at you from the other person or the emotion that you find yourselves in, and sometimes it catches you off guard, right? Sometimes somebody will really zing you with something that triggers that fight or flight response and you need those three bullet points to be able to look back and say, okay, did I cover this? Did I cover this? Don't get wrapped up in trying to, <laughs> I worked with a client once, he was like, okay, I gotta have this tough conversation and I've scripted it out and I've gotten through the first three minutes and I'm like, oh no, that's, this is gonna go badly for you, right? Because somebody's gonna do or say something unexpected. And if you are expecting to be able to sit down and read a script to somebody, you're gonna be way, way off your game. Stephen? Yeah, I was going to say, like, what's the target state? Yeah. 
and that's <coughs> to me that's more of a difficult conversation. It's like I need your butt in that seat at eight thirty, hmm. headset on, ready to go. Yeah. Like there's no, any conflict here, but this is why that's important, mm -hmm. right? And so being being clear about what the target outcome is. To me, it's murkier on the spectrum of conflict when I'm not sure what the ideal state is. Mm -hmm. That's when I tend to start fumbling. So if I don't yeah. have good clarity around where I need to get and where this situation needs to go mm -hmm. um, to set myself up for success. Yeah. I, success is the word I typically use. Is like, ask yourself what success looks like. Right? What does success in this conversation look like? Sometimes success is, I'm going to fire this person with as much respect and dignity as I can. Right? That is sometimes going to be your job. That's success. It's not going to feel like success. Right? It's not, you're not going to love it. That's the other thing I would tell you is don't expect that you are going to be like, yes, I get to fire somebody today. Because you're not. You're not. If you are, maybe that's a chance to check yourself a little bit. <laughs> um, but you're not going to feel good. These are difficult conversations for a reason, right? There, this is the other thing that I think stops people is the expectation that if I just do it right enough, it's not going to feel scary, uncertain. Un it is. It is. It is. You will get more comfortable. You will get more comfortable with the idea that, hey, this is how I feel before these conversations. There's a little bit of uncertainty, right? I've got a little bit of adrenaline going. But you're never going to walk into these and be perfectly, perfectly calm. That's unusual, right? That's unusual. It'll get better, but if you keep waiting for that to happen, you'll never, ever get any better because you won't try it. This is one of those things you have to go out and do, okay? You have to go out and do. Any other questions about that? I feel like you need to know who your audience is because mm -hmm. we recently had a very difficult conversation and the main reason is the recipient, it always seems like the waters get muddied in the middle of a conversation. It's almost like those three bullet points have to be gone over like three or four or five times like by the end of it to see if they got it because it's almost like they're intentionally throwing you off with mm -hmm. other information in order to avoid the actual point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes that's why those conversations are so difficult because you feel like you're already preparing for the fact that are they even going to get it? You know, yep. like are they going to be listening to me? And, you know, there's times where you want to go on a walk with someone and then there's times where you need to be like very clear with someone who needs clarity yeah. in the conversation. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. This continuum of difficult conversations to conflict, you've got to decide, is this a place where I'm trying to understand, where success looks like me kind of saying my piece and then trying to understand what's going on with this employee. Like if you have a performance issue with somebody who's typically a great performer, right, then you might sit them down and say, hey, we've noticed these examples where your performance doesn't match what you've been typically doing and doesn't really match our expectations. What's going on for you, right? That's a different kind of conversation than, hey, look, I need your butt in the seat at 830 so that we can get started doing work. And I know that there's all this stuff, and I'm happy to help you try to figure that out, but at the end of the day, I need your butt in the seat, right? You have to know what you're wading into because you gotta be able to grab different tools out of the toolbox. That's why understanding what success looks like on the front end is so important. Because these conversations can feel a little bit like grabbing jello, right? They just kind of squish all over the place, right? And that's not how you wanna feel. That's not how you want to feel where you look up and say, oh my gosh, I meant for this to take 20 minutes and we've been here for an hour and a half and I'm not, I'm on bullet point one. Well, dang, right? Um, <laughs> you can imagine I've, I've sat through a lot of termination conversations in my career um, and the, the worst one I ever sat through, the supervisor got so nervous that he spent probably 40 minutes telling this poor woman how great she was and literally, so he said, you're fired, but you've been great. 
right? You're fired and 40 minutes of how great you are to the point where this poor woman looked at me at the end and said, I'm lost. Am I fired? Right? Don't do that. You got to know what success is. You got to know what success is. And in that situation, it would have been be brief, be clear, be respectful, and allow this person to leave with some dignity. Okay? So one of the things that impacts how we show up and impacts how other people show up in conflict conversations is our conflict style, right? So I'm sure many of you in here have taken all sorts of personality assessments, right? You may have taken a personality assessment. Okay, this, you can take an assessment, and if we were doing a day-long workshop, this is where we would stop and you would take an assessment on your conflict style we obviously don't have the time to do that today, but if this is something that you think you struggle with or something your team thinks you struggle with, come and talk to me. I can give you some resources where you can go and take this. It's certainly something that we do with folks as well. But your conflict style and the conflict styles that you are going to encounter is a really important part of that toolkit in preparing yourself to be effective. And our conflict style essentially is a mix of two core characteristics. Assertiveness, which you can see there on the vertical axis, and cooperativeness, which you see there across the bottom. All right. Assertiveness is our ability, essentially, to stick to our bullet points. It's our ability to stay connected to our own agenda, to our own needs in the situation, and to advocate for those. Right? So how closely can we be anchored to the outcome that we want, to our needs, to our perspective? Cooperativeness is our ability to stay connected to the other person, to understand their needs, their perspectives, what they want to get out of the situation. And cooperativeness is also our ability to value the relationship that's at stake. Right? This is why sometimes people will say, it's easier for me to engage in conflict with people I don't know because I don't have to worry about cooperativeness. Right? I don't have to worry about it because there's not much relationship at stake. All right. There are five core conflict styles, five core conflict styles, and I'll email out the slide. So, I mean, you are welcome to take as many notes as you want. I'm a note taker, but don't feel like you have to scribble everything down. Um, you can see there competing, collaborating, compromising, avoiding, and accommodating, all of which are a mix of these two, right? All of which are a mix. You have a most natural style, okay? You have, um, clients will talk to me about this as like, it feels like that old sweatshirt that I've had since college, right? The one I can put on and it just, it's comfortable. I know I'm always gonna be comfortable in it. I like wearing it. That's your most natural conflict style. We also can adapt our conflict styles. We can and should because there are situations when these are more appropriate. Some of these are more appropriate than others. So I'm gonna go through these and just think as I'm going through them about which one resonates most with you. So we're gonna start at the, at the top left-hand corner there with the competing conflict style, competing conflict style. As you can see, high in assertiveness, low in cooperativeness, very in tune with their own needs, um, if you have ever been described as hard-headed, stubborn, um, perhaps passionate, um, you likely have a competing or at least sometimes have a competing conflict style. Right? With that approach, you're going to take a really firm stance. This is the way it has to be. It has to be this way. So these are for those performance issues that you can't give on. Right? I, you have to be here at 830. Right? You just have to be. We can't give on that. Um, it's also the thing that we're going to use when we need to make fast decisions, right? Fast decisions. The rest of these, to get to a, a point where everyone feels good, you got to engage in some back and forth. But I don't want somebody in the hospital sort of, hey, can we come to a compromise on this treatment plan in the ER? No, no, no please don't. Please do not compromise. Please just treat me the best way you know how in this moment. Okay, so that one of the advantages of the competing style is that it's fast, right? It's fast, it's clear, and it's a great way to deal with really, really important kinds of issues where you don't feel like you can budge. 
What do you think some of the other benefits, some of the other benefits of a competing style are? Winning. Yeah? You get, you get your way, right? Which is sometimes important. As an employer, I need to get my way with regard to performance standards, right? We, I will often say in workshops, like, competing style gets a bad rap. There are times when it is appropriate. There are times when it is destructive, but there are absolutely times when it's appropriate. What are some of the outcroppings of getting your way? What are some of the other kind of sub-benefits of this style? No room for misinterpretation, right? Clear. Clear, it's fast, you get your way. Um, do you think people, if you can sort of think about people who exhibit this competing style, maybe to the, in times when they shouldn't, um, do you think that they are insecure? Sometimes. Oh, I see, yeah, like sometimes. One of the benefits of this, though, is that it can boost your ego, right? It can boost your ego. And that sounds awful, but some of us actually need that. Some of us who, who live a little further down here could use a little more of that, right? You, you maybe can think about this more easily with people on your team. You may have other managers who are doormats, who let people get away with everything, and they actually need a little more of that confidence Right? And embracing more of a competing style of conflict is a great way to get there. The other thing we talk about as a positive of co the competing style on a team in particular is these people are the people who are willing to say the thing that nobody else will say. They're the one that'll bubble the conflict to the surface, right? So they may or may not be the most effective at resolving it, but you actually need a little bit of this energy on a team. Otherwise, you get a lot of that sort of stuff, that tension and resentment under the surface that everybody else is too nice to talk about, right? But computers are like, wait, 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 stop, right? What are some of the negatives of this style, do you think? It's not appropriate for all situations. It's not appropriate for all situations. Why not? It can make someone Not want to talk to you yep. if you always come across as a competitor, if you're always a my way or the highway person, one of the worst effects of that for a leader is that you lose out on feedback, right? You lose out on feedback because the, the people around you go dark. They go quiet, right? So what else? What else makes this not the most effective style? There's no listening. Yeah, there's no listening. Um, you miss out on feedback. You miss out on crucial conversation. You can create a climate of distrust and suspicion, right? It can become a like, why does it always have to be your way? Why can't we at least talk through this, right? You can really upset the atmosphere. So the other thing is when you miss out on feedback, you get surrounded by, by yes people. Right? People become afraid to stand up to you. They'll just fold up their tent. Right? I would also add, in today's environment, you lose a lot of good talent this way. If this is the only tool you have in your toolbox, if it, this is the thing you grab for in every situation, you can lose a lot of good people. I'm going to jump ahead. Questions that you want to consider when deciding whether a, an approach is the most effective is how much do I value the relationship versus the issue? Right, so that's assertiveness versus cooperativeness. Which one is more important in this situation? What are the consequences if I don't do anything? Right, how important is the issue at hand? Can I let this one fizzle out? Any of you with your managing teams, there are some issues that are gonna fizzle out. Right, it's like arguments between kids. Some of it, if you go chasing everything down, that's all you'll spend your day doing. So understanding, can I let this one sit? Do I have the time and energy to get into this, right? Is now the time? Is this worth my time? Or is it something that I can leave alone? These are the questions that you want to run through when you're picking, I'll put it back up in just a second, when you're picking one of these styles, right? You want to run through these kinds of questions to determine which one is most appropriate. 
So use your competing style when you need to stand up for something that's a bet the farm issue, right? Clear performance metrics, ethics, values, morals, when you need to move quickly, when another approach won't work. This is Chris's example, right, of we've tried, we've tried, we've tried, and this person slips and they slide and they dodge. Now we have to be really, really forceful. You have no other choice or you're going to it as a last resort, right? We've tried to work through why you're tardy for work all the time. We've tried to help you. We've tried to support you. Now the issue is you just have to be here. End of story. That's it. This is no longer up for discussion. Yeah, no longer up for discussion. All right, let's talk about the avoiding style. The avoiding style. Okay, so avoiding style also gets a bad rap. It's on the other end of the extreme. Low assertiveness, no cooperation. <laughs> These are the people who just close up shop and go into their shell, right? They just close it up and say, forget it. I'm gonna avoid this altogether. Um, there are some times when avoidance is the most appropriate way to deal with a conflict. When do you think that might be the case? Well, when you don't know how to even feel about the situation quite yet. You need yeah. to process it before you just react. Yeah. This is when those competitors who are like, forget it, I've got some things to say, need to just pump the brakes a little bit and practice just a little bit more of avoidance, right? Let me sort through this and really get clear on what does success look like, really get clear on what are the issues at play, really think through some of these landmines that can come up in the workforce. Give yourself some time. Also, if you know that this is a symptom of something deeper, right? So I'm not going to address the symptom. I'm going to wait and see if I can figure out what's really going on under the surface, okay? Sometimes if you don't have enough power to address the situation, this, think about managing up chain, right? Managing with your own supervisor. Do you raise every complaint that you have? What's the risk if you do? You're a complainer, right? You can't weather through this, you can't do this. So sometimes avoiding a difficult conversation is the appropriate thing to do, right? Um, particularly if it's just not a big deal, if there's no major impact. For those of you who have children, who are married, um, who've ever shared a home with other people, this is the sort of toothpaste cap on or off. Um, we have an argument about whether the soap dispenser should sit down in the sink or on the edge of the sink, um, whether the laundry room door should be open or closed, right? At the end of the day, no one really cares except the people who really care, but no one gets hurt. No one gets hurt if the toothpaste tube gets left off. No one gets hurt if the laundry room door is open, right? So you want to use avoidance when others, when the, the stakes are just not that high. They're just not that high, okay? What's the positive of an avoiding style? This one gets a bad rap, like I said, but what's the positive of it? What does it protect? It protects the relationship, right? I'm not putting anything at risk. I'm deciding this is not a big enough issue for me to, hand, for me to deal with today. What else does it protect? <clears throat> protects my time, right? Like I'm not gonna have a 30 minute conversation about the toothpaste tube again today, right? Because I don't have time for that. And we all know I'm right anyway, right? We all know I'm right, I'm just not gonna say it, okay? So protect the relationship, protect the time. What else does it do? Maybe a situation will, will work out on its own. Yeah. We do miss this sometimes, right? And this is a tough judgment call because not all conflict situations will work out on their own, but sometimes they will. Sometimes you can let two team members figure something out for themselves. Sometimes you can just let an employee's performance dip and they'll get it fixed on their own. Right? Sometimes it is a short-term personal issue. So this is where you have to really check in with your own gut right? and say, is this the appropriate time? Do I have a clear vision of what I need to do here? What's the negative of this style, do you think? What are the biggest negatives? There are some situations that you just should avoid. Why? There are some issues, yeah. When people, 
the problem with competing or avoiding really is when it becomes sort of a habitual style that people aren't using consciously, right? Where th and where they don't feel like they have other tools. So for avoiders, this becomes an issue where they just don't know how to step out and engage in conflict. They're just like, oh, I'm gonna push all of this under the rug. And things like safety, quality, can't be pushed under the rug. These big kind of bet the farm issues need to be addressed. What do you think are some of the other negatives that come into play? Yeah, sometimes this bubbling stuff fizzles and sometimes this bubbling stuff explodes, all right? It can breed this level of resentment that never gets aired. Anybody ever worked on a team that was avoidant like this where we, you just never talk about the tough stuff but everybody kind of low grade hates each other? <laughs> it's miserable, it's miserable, right? In some ways it's more miserable than being engaged in open conflict with one another. Maybe that, that may be my, compete, my natural competing style coming out. Um, but for me, it is always more miserable to be involved in sort of silent, bubbling hatred than just open conflict. All right. Anything else that's a potential negative? Breaking trust. Yeah. Yeah. This really can, can you think about like a, like a river washing away a bank. This is the sort of stuff that can erode trust. Right. And that's surprising to people who are natural avoiders. They're like, what do you mean? We're not, we don't have any conflict. You don't have any trust either because nobody knows where anybody else stands. Nobody knows where anybody else stands. All right. So accommodating. How is accommodating different than avoiding? What do you think? Yeah. Accommodators are, oh, I'll do whatever you say. Right? I'll do whatever you say. If that's what you want, I'll do whatever you say. I'll do whatever it takes to make you happy. Right? Whatever it takes. It's really high in cooperation where avoidance is low in both assertiveness and cooperation. Accommodating is very high, very, very high in cooperation. So what do you think are some of the positives or when should you use an accommodating style? If the stakes are low, and just let the person then it can help build trust. Yeah, right? So these are the things that somebody else cares a whole lot about, and you're like, yeah, okay. I don't, I don't really, like, I don't have a dog in that hunt. I don't care. Sometimes you need to say, I may not remember this because it's not as big a deal to me as it is to you, but I'll try, right? I'll try. But when it doesn't matter to you, accommodating can be a nice way to help build trust, to sort of put good stores in the bank, right? When else should you use this? Maybe if you're wanting to empower somebody. Okay, can you say more about that? What if you have someone that comes to you about, this is what I think we should do with this, and you really don't have a stake in that, but if it, if it brings the outcome still the same way, there's 10 ways to skin a cat. So just yes. skin it that way, that sounds fun. Yeah. Um, first of all, I love it when somebody else uses the same language as me. Like there's, there are many ways to skin a cat. I don't care how you get it done. My, when I say this even to my children, they look at me like I've lost my mind. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but it is a really nice way to say like, if you think this is going to work, I'm not so wrapped up in the how, right? I'm not so wrapped up in the method. I want to get to the results, but if you think we should try it this way and it's not safety or quality or bet the farm sort of stuff, go for it, right? Accommodating, this is a great way to help grow a team, to help develop a team, right? What else? What are some of the other advantages of accommodating? Saves time. Saves time. Tied up in the back and forth of the discussion. Yeah. Go ahead, let's try it. Yeah. This is like... I don't care, it's not that important to me, I'm gonna let it go, there's really no point in arguing, right? It's just not that important. Um, what do you think some of the negatives are of an accommodating style? If you accommodate one person, it can affect the morale of an entire team, and it's mm -hmm. a negative, yeah. unfair, unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or even if it's a positive, right? So if I accommodate one person's need to take Friday afternoons off, 
Have I resolved an issue or created an issue for myself? <laughs> right? Sometimes, this is another perfect example where you, as long as you're using this consciously and strategically, it's fine. Right? If this is the only style that you have, you're going to find yourself in situations where it really hurts you. Right? You're going to accommodate things where you should be holding a line. Right? And you're going to end up with like policy nightmares all over the place and HR and legal is going to be real mad at you all the time. Right? What else? What are some of the other negatives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you sort of start to feel, number one, about yourself like you're a doormat. Right? Like, I don't, I don't know how. It's been so long since I've stood up for myself, I don't know how to do it. And everybody else sort of expects that you're the nice one. Right? Every, like, think about your group of friends. There's probably a nice one. There's the one that's like, I don't care where we go to dinner. Mm -hmm. I don't care where we go on our trip. I don't care, blah, blah, blah. And then when that person finally is like, I really want to go eat Mexican food tonight, everybody's like, oh, my God. Right? That can happen on a team, too. You can get this, you get sort of put in a seat that you can't get out of, that you can't get out of. It also allows communication to break down, right? If this is all you can do, Right? That's your sort of habitual response. It allows communication to break down. So compromising, the compromising style says we're going to meet in the middle. We're going to meet in the middle. And that's what most of us will say like that's the gold standard. Right? That's what we want. We want to find a compromise. Here's what I can tell you about compromise. Compromise is how we make legal settlements right? We horse trade, right? I'll give you this if you'll give me that. I can promise you that no one has ever walked out of a lawyer's office with a settlement that they were happy about. They always think they got too little, they paid too much, right? The biggest downside of a compromising style is that it provides a temporary solution that nobody is really thrilled with, right? That nobody is really thrilled with. It's kind of eh. The other downside is you can't always compromise, right? You can't always compromise. It's just not always possible. There are some things that are all or nothing, right? There are some things that are all or nothing. You can't have a fully remote team and a fully in the office team. You can have a hybrid team, right? But you can't have both one day and then switch it back and forth all the time, right? You, we saw this a lot in the immediate aftermath of COVID where people were like, well, some of you can come back and some of you can work from home. And do you remember what a nightmare that was? Right? That's because compromising. We went to it because it was fast. Because it's fast and we had to. We had a temporary solution that we had to create. But in the long term, it didn't really suit anybody's needs. Right? So you want to choose compromising when you need something fast, you need something temporary and you just have to have a solution right you just have to have a solution what do you think are the big downsides or the big positives of compromising i think a lot of time when people think compromise it's thinking but in reality it's in marriage it's 90 10 70 30 you know mm -hmm. yeah compromise does give this like the illusion that we're going to go into this equally right, right? And that's not usually true. That's not usually true. It's not usually true in the workplace either. And it's not always appropriate for it to be true in the workplace. What else? What are some of the other negatives of compromising? A lot of times you don't get to the heart of the matter where, where conflict is involved. I mean, because two people have two good ideas, and they're both perfectly fine ideas, but one may be better than the other. Yeah. But if you water both of them down, you end up with the worst of them. Yeah, very often the compromise, and we you hear this, right? If you really listen in business, you'll hear people say, well, that was a compromise solution that didn't really solve anything, right? We, we band-aided that, right? We band-aided. Or, or politics sometimes, right? It's like, well, who thought, if we had this idea and this idea, and y'all came up with that, like this weird robot idea in the middle, this is where you can get a lot of really Frankenstein kind of business solutions, where we bolt on this and we bolt on that, and then we end up with this thing that doesn't really solve anything at all, right? What are the positives, though? What are the positives of compromise? Yeah. 
closure is the is one of them right you are at least bringing something to an end you are tamping off the cost you think about the legal example right that's why people compromise is to stop stop the bleeding on bills right stop the time that we're associating this let's just get to the end right so that's why compromising comes into play um, the final style is collaborating and this is where you are high in assertiveness and high in cooperation right this is where everybody comes together everybody brings their point of view everybody sort of has their say and you get to this place where you have a 2 plus 2 equals 5 kind of solution all right we take the best part of your ideas we take the best part of my idea and we come up with something that's either even better than either one of us could have come up with individually okay when do you think this sort of style is the most important when you have to have a win-win it's really when the solution is the most important thing right when the solution and the relationship is the most important thing what do you have to have to make collaboration possible time you gotta have a lot of time a lot of trust a good decision making and communication process right if you try to push this quickly you won't end up with collaboration what you will do is put so much pressure on that that team or that group of people that they'll sort of squeeze out to their natural styles and eventually the people who are competitors will walk out and be like well that was a great collaborative solution that's fantastic because all the accommodators and the avoiders were like I'm not doing this today right I'm not doing this today so you can't force collaboration if you try to force collaboration what you will end up with is is often artificial harmony right artificial harmony usually yeah it's a slow process it's unusual that you're going to do unless the issue is small but important and the parties are already really close together like my solution and your solution are just a smidgen apart right then you can collaborate relatively quickly particularly if trust is high if we're sort of all aiming at the same thing we're really aligned we really trust each other but typically collaboration is slow very very slow um, and often iterative and what I mean by that is often we come up with this is our first step at a solution whoops we missed it a little bit we got to go back and try to collaborate again and sort of revise it so collaboration is slow it puts a lot of value on relationships the other positive is that you do often come up with a better solution than anybody else thought of on their own right that's why we do these sorts of things that's why we do these sorts of things so use this when both the issue and the relationship are important when you get value from lots of different perspectives right lots of different perspectives where there's a significant impact and we're part of the reason that sort of the complexity of our organizations is becoming a challenge is because of the the spread of the impact of one decision on other departments right it used to be that I could make my decision for my department I could move on and it didn't affect your department but those sort of interdependencies and complexities of organizations have really forced us to go more to this collaboration style at the same time trying to force us to move faster right and that's that's really challenging so if you work with high level executive teams they'll talk about how difficult this is in today's environment right but the other positive is you get to consider everybody else's point of view everybody else's point of view okay any questions about conflict styles? That's a lot to try to squeeze in, but it's really important. I have one more yeah. thought on the collaborating. So trust, you need, you need trust to be su successful. However, it can be, if you do it right, it can be a trust builder on a team that may, that may be lacking. But that's really hard to do internally. You probably need an external facilitator to help you do that. Sometimes, sometimes if you have a leader within a team that's, that's good at facilitation, they can do this. Um, if they can stay sort of in a clean spot and if trust is high I would also say the the more you build a track record of being able to do this the more people are willing to wade into it but it feels risky it feels risky for um, competitors to sort of turn down the heat because the risk to them is like we're not getting anything done we're not gonna solve this problem we're gonna sit in here and brainstorm for the next three days when I walk out and have the same problem as we had before 
and it feels risky for your accommodators and avoiders because they're like, I'm going to get into this big sticky mess where emotions are going to be really high and we're not going to solve the problem, right? So you have to start slow with this if you've never done it before with your team or with your organization and sort of build it up over time, okay? Any other questions about that? All right, so let's talk about best practices. These are sort of those hard strategies, tips and tricks. The first thing that you want to do to be effective at communication, at difficult conversations, at conflict, is to prepare yourself in advance. And part of that are things like this, skills building, right? Awareness building, self-awareness, understanding yourself, understanding your team. But there are also tricks that you can put in place um, before the conversation. So spend some time as you're working on your mindset, as you're moving past your immediate emotional reaction, hey, what are the personality dynamics that are at play? What's going on with me? Why does this make me so angry? Why does it make me so angry that performance is sliding? Well, because like we're up against big headwinds or this is like the third quarter in a row that we've had this problem with performance, right? I'm, I'm sort of done having this conversation. Really think about what's going on with you why you feel as strongly about something as you do, and think about the personality dynamics that are at play with the other person engaged in the conflict. Think about that level of trust, right? Think about that level of trust. Do we have high trust in this team? Can we say hard things back and forth to each other, or is trust relatively low, right? Trust can be low either because it's not been built or because it's been damaged, so new teams, Listen, if you have a new team, trust is low. It's just low, right? If you have a significant portion of the team that is new, trust is low. If you are a new leader to a team that's been there for a long time, trust is low, right? It, trust has to be formed over time, and then it can be broken and has to be repaired, but you have to really think carefully about that. Think about the derailing topics, right? What are the hot buttons? What are the sacred cows that could get poked? What are the things that you know are gonna trigger you so that you can be aware of it? What do you know is gonna trigger this other person, right? If it's somebody you've worked with for a long time, you may um, even know things about their particular quirks, like I'm not gonna talk to them right before lunch because whew, no, right? I had a team that knew that if my hair was pulled back with a regular office rubber band instead of a hair tie, <laughs> that I was having a real bad day, and you should probably wait until tomorrow, or at least until I took that office rubber band out of my hair, right? Um, think about who you're dealing with. Think about how you're showing up. Those are the things that you can do to prepare in addition to understanding the issue, understanding the players, painting a picture for yourself of what success looks like. You want to practice good habits. These are the things that we've talked about a little bit, um, sort of around and about in our time this morning. But good conflict habits are the habits that turn down the temperature, turn down the heat, de-escalate the situation. So think about using words that are not hot, right? Think about using words that are not big. Some of us are big communicators, right? My husband tells me, and, and now my teenage boys tell me, that girls use too many adjectives. I don't know that they're right. I think that their world is very boring where it's just caveman talk and all just <laughs> nouns and verbs all the time. But they will say, like, when you turn up the temperature unnecessarily, it feels weird, right? So be aware of the temperature of your words. Are they big, incendiary, start a fight kind of words? or are they calm, we can find a resolution, solutions based, okay? Don't be aware of going too far the other way though. Some of the active listening techniques that you can read in books, if you use those with the wrong person, that, that is a real trigger, right? So try just to use plain language as much as you can, right? Try to talk this out. If you've got an office, close the door and say, what do I wanna say to this person? If they were standing right here, how would I say this the most clearly, okay? Be aware of your language, be aware of your body posture and the tone of your voice, and stay curious. 
use questions unless you're in this situation where you're like this is the end of the road right it has to happen until then you want to stay curious so think about where you are on that continuum and how much curiosity is appropriate but if you're at the beginning and somebody's just starting to demonstrate challenges with their performance then staying curious can be really really helpful I will also say if you can stay curious it helps tone down your own internal temperature right it's a great way it doesn't it's not all that effective to say don't get angry don't get angry don't get angry because you just if you can say hey how can I get curious here that's a great way that will automatically drop your temperature and then finally and this is my favorite conflict tip so I always save it till the end and that is find the issue find the issue find the third thing um, and with teams that we've worked with for a long time with executives that we've worked with for a long time we'll be having a conversation and I'll just do this <laughs> like what's the third thing we typically think about conflict as being you versus me, you versus them, you versus the other person, right? It's a very head-to-head -head sort of thing. If you can find the thing that you are jointly battling, right? If you can find the thing that you are jointly battling and get it clear in your mind, you are often able to come to that conflict in a much more resilient way and frankly, a much more effective way. Right? It keeps you from seeing the other person as the enemy and helps you see the problem on a bigger scale. I can give you an example of this. We worked with a team that was really wrapped up in conflict. They were at each other's throats. Like the leader said, I'm gonna have to, I literally am going to have to fire half this team if we don't get this fixed because they have divided down the middle and they just will not meet. They will not meet in the middle regardless of what happens. Well, one of the things that we figured out was a problem that they were battling was scarcity of resources, right? There wasn't enough money, there wasn't enough equipment, there wasn't enough funding to go around. And so when there's not enough, people get in and scrap for what's left. And when they were able to make that explicit, just saying like, hey, we are all collectively dealing with a shortage of funding. We are all collectively dealing with not enough headcount in our department. We are all collectively dealing with some command from on high that doesn't make a lot of sense to us. How do we come together and jointly solve this problem? That's a much more effective way of moving into that conversation. So the last thing I'm going to ask you to do today is to think about your conflict situation that you wrote down and just spend a couple of minutes thinking about if there's a third thing there. And if anybody wants to share, we can try to find your third thing. And I'm gonna hang, I'll hang around for a few minutes so if it's not one you can share out loud, that's fine. But just spend a couple of minutes thinking about what's the third thing that we're up against? Is it a bad policy? Is it a bad decision from somewhere else? Is it tough market conditions? Is it, hey, we all know we're short-staffed. Right? And then if you can come up with a third thing, how might that change the way you address your conflict situation? How might that change how you address your conflict situation? All right. We've got a couple of minutes left. I'm happy to take any questions or anything that didn't get covered from those call outs this morning. And like I said, I'll be around for a few minutes. So if you need to take off, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. If you have questions, like I said, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, the first thing I would, I would say is sometimes we need to think really carefully about why we need people to admit fault. Sometimes that has to do with us. Some, if it's like, I need you to change your behavior going forward, consider letting that person save face and not admitting fault, sort of not saying, okay, you're right, I screwed up. 
and just saying, how can we agree to move forward? It's really hard for a lot of people to say, yeah, I get it, I screwed up, I messed up. That feels very vulnerable. Um, and a lot of people just won't ever do it, right? Because it's a personality style for them. Consider trying to move to the solution instead of trying to attach fault quite so much. Um, if it's a kind of like factual thing, like, hey, you were here at 845 again, you just gotta keep track of that sort of stuff. Is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. Paul, did I step on your toes? Do you have announcements? You need announcements? Okay. Um, anybody else have questions? Questions? Going once, going twice. Do you have announcements you need to make? Okay. I just want to thank you all.